We've got an exciting portion of scripture in Timothy to share with you today. And I know that you're going to enjoy this one on the gift of prophecy because we can bring this one right down to earth and bring it right applicable to today. And I think maybe we'll get some real enjoyment out of it. I have the references here on my board. And so for those of you who are following me, you can use these references for as you write them down. And we're starting off here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timmy, my son. In the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, I'm going to read all of these verses in Timothy first, and then we're going to come back and study them. Then we're going on to verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timmy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might war a good warfare. And then on to chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Then on from 12 to 14. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Then we go down to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which was in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now we're going to go back there to 1 Timothy chapter 1 again and look at some of these portions of scripture. First of all, let's note, please, that Timothy is referred to as Paul's son in the faith. It would apparently appear as though Timothy was not only a young man in years, but young also in the faith and was Paul's son in the faith. Every time you lead someone to the Lord, they will be either your son or your daughter in the faith. Even if you are six years old. <laughs> and when you lead another person, an adult or a boy or girl to the Lord, they are your son or your daughter in the faith. However, we note here that Paul is saying something to Timothy. He says, Timmy, I want you to now fill my place as pastor here with the Ephesians. I'm leaving, and I want you to fill the job as pastor. <laughs> hey, listen, I wonder how many of you fellows would like to fill those shoes, hey? How would you like to be that one who would come in after Paul, the great <laughs> theologian? Oh, I tell you, that great Paul. You would, wouldn't you? Oh, sure, you would. Yes, you would. <laughs> you look like you'd be just the right kind of a guy to fill those shoes. <laughs> now, why was Timothy chosen for that particular job? You see, he was obviously not only young in the faith, but he was also uh, a young man. By what way was, Paul, was Timothy chosen for this job? Was it because they thought he might have a way with the young people? I mean, he could get up there and he could lead the songs and he could really go to... Don't you think that was the reason that he did this? Well, I tell you what, maybe he uh, was a good speaker. He had a special way of just saying words just right, very eloquent with the way he talked. You suppose maybe that might be the reason he was chosen as pastor for that position? Maybe he knew how to take up the offering. Maybe he had a special way of getting funds in to raise up for the church. <laughs> there are some people, you know, that, they, that do this. Yes, I know this. <laughs> By what basis do you think that Timothy was chosen for that job? Now, I will guarantee you that that would be a hard act to follow in Paul's shoes, would it not? 
Here is Paul ministering to these Ephesians and he has built these people up in the faith. Now we have a young man coming up in the pulpit, Timothy. And we've got these old warriors of the faith sitting there with their arms folded like this. He's sure not a Paul. <laughs> Can't touch a candle to him. Do you know that this is why Paul said, let no man despise thy youth, right? But still, why was Timothy chosen for the position of pastor? He knew very well that these old warriors of the faith were going to just really give him a bad time. And I guarantee you it wouldn't be an easy job to fill. But why was Timothy chosen for the job that he was chosen? I think this is priceless. Verse 18 of chapter 1 in 1 Timothy says it. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timmy, according to the prophecies that went over on you. You see, the elders of the church had laid their hands upon him, and the prophecies, and there was more than one, obviously, it says prophecies, doesn't it? So there was many more than one prophecy that came over him. And none of them are written there. Wouldn't you have liked to have read the prophecies? Eh? Wouldn't it have been neat to see what it was that Timothy, why he was chosen there to be the pastor after Paul got through? And you see, the, the hands were laid on Timothy, and they also, it said, neglect not the gift that is in thee which is given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the, of the presbytery, and in another place, it said, stir up the gift of God, which is in thee. A lot of people seem to feel that when hands were laid on Timothy, that now, now it is declared over him what he is to be. They feel that gifts of the Spirit are imparted when people lay their hands on them. I believe what is being spoken here is this. We are, we are studying that all of the gifts are for everybody. You have all nine gifts of the Spirit. Each person who believes on Christ unto salvation, each person who is filled with the Spirit of God, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, has all automatically all nine gifts of the Spirit. So in essence, no gifts are imparted right at that point. You've already got the gifts. But hands were laid on Timothy, and it says, Timothy, stir up the gifts that are within you. Everybody knows when you make a cake that, uh, you know, you put ingredients in the, cake, in, the, in the pan, right? And you stir up those ingredients and you get the cake out of it. Now, obviously, Timothy had all of the ingredients that were made to go to fill the shoes of Paul in that pastorate. But why specifically was Timothy chosen instead of anybody else in that assembly? And I will guarantee you that if we were to move more in this area for the choosing of pastors and leaders and teachers and people in the assembly, we would probably run into a lot less problems. Many times people are put into the pastorate because they have taken a great long course in, theologi uh, in theology and they have it all oozing out of their ears and they know how to give every bit of it. They can preach circles around many people. But I've also, and I've lived long enough to know that there are some of these, I'm not saying all of them, I'm not giving a blanket, blanket statement, so don't misunderstand me. Some of them have no thought whatsoever for the people. Absolutely none. The people, the sheep, scatter all over the place. They could care less. All that they're concerned about is getting that security behind them of money coming in monthly. And then there are other pastors who knock themselves out for their sheep. I'll tell you, they're true pastors indeed. They care for their flock. They nourish them. And when any of them are out wandering around, they will carefully bring them back in and care for them and look after them. I think I noticed this primarily about this person I was working with in the West Indies. My goodness, anybody look at any one of her sheep and look like they were going to touch them and she would just rise up like a grizzly bear, you know. Don't you touch one of my sheep. <laughs> Why, she just mothered every one of them. A true pastor 
This is what a shepherd or a shepherdess does. And I know that we can, a person can be called a minister or a pastor, but it's the pastor at heart. God is raising up these days many under shepherds, under pastors, because the cheap are not being cared for as they should, and they're rising up all over the place. When we go into the subject of the, what is a prophet in the body ministry of a prophet, we're going to see something there as well that we don't have to be, uh, let's say, a qualified theologian and have man's credentials. I know they are necessary. We need to have people who are going to be leaders know the Bible and understand the Bible and understand theology. And again, don't misunderstand me about that. But by the same token, we are also aware that God is raising up people who care for the flock, and they can be those who care for small individual groups in their homes, in small assemblies, in any place, in many, many places. And they are called shepherds or pastors because they care for a flock, no matter what size they are, be it five, be it six, be it uh, a thousand. Now, Timothy is chosen on some other basis. Because of the prophecies that went over him, and we note in chapter, one, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1 where it says, The Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then you also note in the second Timothy, chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6, it talks about the faith that came down from his grandmama and his mama. And Timothy, by very necessity, to fill the shoes in that pastorate had to excel in two of the gifts of the Spirit. The gift of the discerning of spirits and the gift of faith. Oh, now it makes a little more sense. The prophetic utterances brought this out. And as you note here, in fact, if, as you look all through this chapter 4, it speaks of spirit the force and spirit problems, and then it talks about the faith as well in the hearts of, uh, in the heart of Timothy. Now, this is what happens when prophecy is given. As I've mentioned to you in one of the other seminars, in oftentimes in our closing sessions, we will minister over people and prophesy over them. People have come to me and said, Mary, what authority do you have to prophesy over people like this? Well, <laughs> I'm convinced of this, you know. Of course, Jesus says, the works I do shall you do also. And I see here in the scriptures where God anointed teachers and prophets and those to minister those things. Well, uh, if I believe before God I'm called to do this, then bless God, he hasn't changed a bit, you know. He's still the same. It's just that we've got to carry and do the work and the ministry as we are called to so do. And so many times I will do as they did in, the, in those times, and I will fast and pray before I minister and prophesy over the people who have completed the course on the gifts of the Spirit. Now, depending upon the size of the group of people, if it doesn't run up to more than about 20 people, I can prophesy over each of them, those that want to graduate, those that want to go out into the gift ministry, and I see that their, 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 their ministries are being effective and it's being anointed of God, then I will bless them or prophesy over each of them. And what this does is stir up what is already in them. They've learned the things of God, they've studied the things of God in the gifts of the Spirit, and now what we do is we bless them and, well, prophesy over them, and that causes them to stir up what is already there. And that's what the laying on of hands does, and that's what prophecy does. I'm absolutely amazed at how it works. The nun that I have mentioned to you from time to time who had asked me to come out to Malaysia and Singapore, and while we were out there, she did not have opportunity during our graduating exercises to receive a prophetic word over her. I administer to several others, and I will give you one of those illustrations in a minute as well. But when uh, she came over to Canada on a sabbatical, and I was graduating one of my seminars, and I asked her if she would like to have a blessing at one of those seminars. She said, boy, I, I really would. I would really love to have a blessing. And so I laid hands on her and prophesied over her. Now, this is the type of prophecy that came over her. Surely, saith the Lord, I would do a beautiful thing within thee, for thou art gracious 
and I would cause the word of God to be made very plain coming forth from thy lips. Yea, pattern not thyself after another, but yea, be thyself. Try not to be someone else, for yea, thou art unique in mine eyes. And it went on to, to say this type of a prophetic utterance, just to be herself and not try to pattern herself after someone else, and God would move mightily in her life. Well, I thought no more of the prophetic utterance. We took it on the tape recording. She typed it off the tape recording and kept it. And at this point, she had been asked to go up into central British Columbia and there to minister in a number of meetings on a circuit. She came back after a couple of weeks, and she looked like she was smiling a Cheshire cat grinned, you know? She looked like something really wonderful had happened. And I looked at her and I said, say, Sister Marie, you know, you look like something great happened up there. Uh, tell me about it. Well, she said, it was the prophecy that did it. I said, what? The prophecy, she said, you remember the prophecy that you gave over me and uh, just, you know, before I went up north? And I said, yes. I says, well, how did that do it? She says, well, I've got a confession to make, Mary. I says, well, do you want me to put my collar on backwards or what? <laughs> she says, no, look, she said, do you know what? She said, I used to watch the way you used to minister. And she said, you, you know, you're so outspoken and you just have a way of doing things. And she said, I wanted to pattern myself after you. And I wanted to speak the way that you spoke and do what you did. And she says, I was trying so hard to do exactly what you were doing. And I says, oh, you've got to be kidding. Oh, no, you not really. And I prophesied this out of my own mouth. Pattern not thyself after another. <laughs> you see, if we stopped to think of what we were saying, we might not say it. So here she was then, um, you know, trying to pattern herself after me. And she wasn't getting anywhere. Nothing was happening. It was just seemed to be like it was forced issue all the time. So I went to listen, continued to listen to her story. And she says, well, Mary, after I started to minister up there, she said, I decided I was going to now be myself. I was no longer going to try to be anybody else but myself. And she said, I made a pact with God that I would do whatever he wanted me to do. And even though I couldn't talk like Mary Goddard and, and act like her and, and go ahead about my ministry like her, I was going to be myself in spite of it. So she said, everybody I laid my hands on was slain by the power of God. Everybody I ministered to, she says, words just flowed out of my mouth every time I went to speak. And she said, I discovered something wonderful. That she said, I had something inside of me that was indeed unique and different from you. So she says, please, Mary, don't feel badly now because I don't try to be like you. <laughs> I laughed. I said, oh, praise the name of Jesus. I am so thrilled. I am so thrilled that you have decided to be yourself, that you have decided to do what God wants you to do and just be unique. You know something? I do not like to see people come out of my seminars like rubber stamps. Here comes another Mary Goddard. <laughs> You know, this is the way they sometimes come out of Bible schools. <laughs> they look like the dean. They act like the dean. They walk like the dean. They talk like the dean. <laughs> so please, when we get into these teaching seminars, we like people to be unique. We want them to be completely God able to be use them, that they will stir up the gifts that are within them. There are gifts inside of you, and what prophecy does will stir them up. That's, you know, prophecy is a fantastic tool to get us really moving in the ministry. I've had a new, uh, numerous people calling me after they have received prophetic utterances upon graduation. And they will call me up and say, Mary, do you know that prophecy that you brought over me was just the most wonderful thing because it has encouraged me. And now I see the prophecy being fulfilled in my life and it keeps me going. And I am just so thrilled in the ministry. And the more we enter into doing the things that the, even the prophetic utterance declared, the more results we see, the more fruit we see. In fact, I just had someone say to me today, you know, the prophecy that you brought over me is being fulfilled. And uh, we're just praising God 
for the fulfillment of prophecy and the fact that it can be used to bless others in their ministries. Come back and join us next time and we will be just thrilled to share with you some more on the gift of prophecy.